Now, will you stand with me, please? We will be in John 6. John 6, if you're using the Pew Bible, it's on page 1056. We're going to be in verses 29 through 34. As we are traveling through one of the greatest teachings of Jesus, all, uh, most often known as the Bread of Life Discourse, we'll be reading and studying verses 29 through 34. And God's Word says this, Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What miraculous sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as it is written, He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. You may be seated. It is amazing that anyone is saved. Does that kind of make you stop for a second? Like, what did you just say? It is amazing that anyone is saved. Especially with people who hold on to some external form of religiosity. Some kind of belief in a God, but actually, in reality, that belief is a false belief. A false conversion. There are many obstacles that lay in front of true belief. Many of them. And we have seen exam example after example already in just this Gospel of John alone. Instances that are hard to miss if we are honest with the Scriptures. And we ought to be. It is the powerful, effective love of God that takes away these obstacles and gives us Jesus. Obstacles that we ourselves have put up. Ones that captivate our heart. Ones that enslave us to wanting more and more. Ones where we build a standard, a wall up that seems to be impenetrable. God's saving grace can and does remove these obstacles. He takes away any obstacle he pleases when he pleases. And he does so with ease. In this plan to save, God has been gracious to reveal himself in his word and to show us these obstacles and pitfalls. He does this to warn us, to expose us, empty us, rebuke us, regenerate us, change us, renew us, discipline us, and conform us. What have been some of these obstacles we've seen so far in this gospel? We've seen the darkened understanding We've seen the desire and pursuit of unjust gain corrupting the worship of God. We've seen the lifeless heart. We've seen the loveless heart. We've seen some of the most externally righteous show their ignorance, great ignorance, and rejection of God. We've seen the heart taken away by legalistic obedience to the law. We've seen a thirst for worldly satisfaction. We've seen the desire to be hidden and to be not seen by others. We've seen those caught up in a worship that they do not know. We've seen people driven by their own opinions. We've seen those who are given over to doing evil. We've seen human standards that can never be met because the human is never satisfied, whether it has to do with testimonies or signs or other situations. We've seen a salvation in Scripture and not in Christ. We've seen the need for approval of others. We've seen those not accepting God at His word. And we've seen those thinking they need to do more work. And today we will see the need and demand for more proof. And we will see the need and demand for temporal provision. And we will see the need and demand for Jesus to do better than someone else who has come before Him. Humanly speaking, we've seen a lot of obstacles. If we take our time through this gospel alone, we'll notice these obstacles and how many there are. We'll see, we see a lot of them, and we create these ourselves. 
obstacles that should make us see how amazing it is that God would save anyone. These should cause us to recognize and rest in how powerful God's love truly is. It really is in and through Jesus alone. This gets more into revealing how God loved the world and sending his son in Christ and how this love is a sovereign love that brings life to those who are under God's wrath, who are already condemned, as scripture says, as John says, and who face perishing for eternity. God's love in Christ and through his substitutionary work takes away all of that in salvation as he demolishes any obstacle between us and Jesus. He clears the path to Christ so that in that work of clearing away, he causes us to see Jesus and Jesus alone, high and lifted up where he is, where he ought to be. He makes us see who he really is and why he truly came because of who we really are. We're not ashamed of shedding light on these obstacles, honestly discussing them because God uses his truth, his truth that empties us of ourselves and fills us with Jesus. So today we'll look at these obstacles to true belief. There are three of them from the perspective of these people in the crowd that we have been witnessing. Each of these points are stated as if this is what they would say to Jesus. So if you're taking notes, these are the points for today. Number one is the obstacle of prove yourself. This is what they would say to Jesus. Prove yourself. The second obstacle is top that one. Top that one. And the third obstacle is give me more. Give me more. After that, we'll see who emerges after these obstacles are taken away, where it's like Jesus saying to these people, you have no idea. That will be our fourth point. You have no idea. So as these people say, prove yourself, top that one, give me more, Jesus says to them, you have no idea. These obstacles that we create for ourselves are so strong. And if you truly know what salvation is, you would agree with me. They're so strong, especially for these Jewish people. This is in the third year of Jesus' earthly ministry. And they're still demanding more signs from him. I mean, think about that. They're still demanding more signs from Jesus. He has already given them plenty of signs. But they're still not satisfied by what they've seen. In that, they still have not seen who he truly is and why he truly came. This is man creating our own standard of justification by saying, if you don't meet my terms, my standard, my commands, then you will not be justified in your claims. I judge things my way, man says to God. So if you don't meet my standard... You won't be innocent, according to me. Verse 30. So they asked him, what miraculous sign will you do or will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? They're saying, prove yourself. Which is something they've said over and over and over again. The problem with their problem is that it goes deeper than them just not being satisfied by some evidence. They, for one, are not understanding what these signs are to mean. The spiritual truth behind them. The reason that Jesus does them. They're physical illustrations that are to teach spiritual truth to those who can hear it. Who can see for it for what it is. Two, they're not hearing the word of Jesus that is behind these signs where he proclaims the good news about salvation in himself. And three, this then means that they don't truly believe in him. A crucial aspect of this is that they're not taking Jesus at his word. They're not even taking God the Father at his word, as we'll see soon. But what they are doing is creating their own standards of approval, their own courtroom of justification. This shows the incredible rebellion of mankind. Because we are doing what only God has the right to do. Think about this with me. He is the only one who is just. 
who is fair in having a standard we are to meet. He is fair in this because we are the ones who have transgressed against his law. We are the ones who have turned our backs in rebellion. So for us sinful human beings to create essentially an impossible standard on our end for God to meet is a massive offense to God. A massive offense to him. We've essentially tried to trade places with him, usurping his authority. And we put ourselves up on his throne in a hostile takeover. That's what we do as sinful human beings who try to create our own standard for for examining him and, and, and looking at this world. We end up playing judge, demanding Jesus prove himself to us. This is what they're doing in many respects. But what patience of God to endure our wickedness? Because that's what it is. It's wickedness. But what patience of God to endure this? So that his power can be displayed in tearing away these obstacles that we build ourselves. What grace to humble us. He does this as he pleases because he has the right to not only be just but also merciful, and thankfully he is, and he delights in that mercy. Having pity and compassion on sinners who rage war against them. And we do so in our heart and in our actions. To think he is merciful to sinners who have the audacity to demand proof, create a standard for him to line up to, and at the foundation to choose to view the way uh, the world works according to their own views, their own opinions. We're liable to do this when we change the order of how we answer the many questions in life. This is an application for us to see. If we answer these many questions from our experience first, from our perspective first, which is essentially what these people are doing, from our human reason first, before we go to God's word, then we will run into many, many problems. These people in this crowd are doing this. The foundation that we must move from first is the foundation of what God has said. What God has said. But we live as if God's proof isn't good enough. Let's take the example of abortion for a second. Because this is prevalent in our society. If I look at it first from the standpoint that every human, every person has and must have the right to choose for themselves what they think is right. And who is anyone to tell them what to do? Then I'm starting from a foundation that is humanistic. It is a foundation that starts with the human and my opinion about humanity first. If we start outside of God's revelation in Scripture then, and then go to Scripture, then we change when we are very liable to change what God has said so that it fits our word, our box, our foundation, our standard. We can do this when we start with our culture first as well and any other foundation before God's. If we start outside of Scripture to view the world, Instead of God first, we're in major problems. Ultimately, this is rejecting the authority of God's word and what he has said about what faith is and what life is about. Then when we are confronted with what he actually has said, many times, sinful man says, I don't approve. I don't approve of that. In that we create our own standard. Even if we demand more proof or not, we create a standard. This is a principle here where the word of God is rejected and a different standard of measurement is built upon. This can even give us insight to these miracles, these signs of Jesus and why they were performed, what, why Jesus was doing them. They're ultimately to authenticate God's word and Jesus himself, who Jesus truly was. This can make us kind of think about today's society, even within the major and, and majority of Christianity today, where people are running after signs. Signs of healing, signs of wonder, signs of things that 
We need to slow down and say, wait a minute. Jesus isn't even giving them signs here. Why? Because these signs are bedded in proving that Jesus is God. And he's shown them enough. And they still don't believe. They see him, yet they don't believe. So we need to think about these things and discern and be careful of what we may be getting into. Because people, as we see here an example, they flee after, seen, after signs. They're captivated by them, by the extraordinary, by something miraculous. And so they're enamored by it and distracted by it. And Jesus is not giving them ultimately what they want. And he does so for good reason. To add to this craziness of demanding more signs from Jesus, these people also essentially say, you know what, we have an example of a sign that you need to top. You need to do better. Here's the example of Moses. Now top that, Jesus. This magnifies their ignorance and intent of the heart for at least three reasons. Number one, they've missed the fact that the manna was supposed to show them Jesus. Jesus tells them this by saying that the manna that their forefathers had was to point them to the true bread that comes from heaven, which is him standing right before them. Two, they look down upon Jesus for taking something that was already there and multiplying it. And the great, the great miracle of the feeding of 5,000 instead of creating something out of nothing. This is an example of another standard created by man. They think Moses performed the miracle and he did it for a much longer period of time and that manna fed way more people. So to them, what Jesus just did in feeding the 5,000 really didn't impress them. They want more. They're saying to Jesus, you know what? You just did that, but that wasn't good enough. Top Moses. Though they appealed to Scripture... Th Though they appealed to scripture, number three, they are, they're totally ignorant of the very scripture they appeal to. This is the one that is quite astounding because of the implications. For one, because they are utterly blind to God's word. They think Moses was the one who gave them the manna, when clearly God's word says that it was God who gave it to them. Some implications affect those previous reasons that I just went to, but then this ultimately affects who they trust in and shows who one of their gods is in reality. They trust in Moses. And essentially, their god is Moses. Think about this. They've disregarded God the Father when they ignore his provision of the manna, and by result, they've elevated Moses above God and certainly above Jesus as they demand that he prove himself more and top Moses. So they're really believing in Moses. They're elevating Moses as a false god in principle. In this, we can see an application for us now. But in order to see this, we need to see the principle from God's word first in this instance. Instead of knowing and trusting that God provides, and he alone is the one who does so, they trust in someone else. And with this provision being a substance that they rely on, that they take in as food, they then live on this provided substance that's given, they think, by someone other than God. And plus, this substance is a determining factor for how they live. We can do the same if we're not careful in many, many areas. One place where we can do this is trusting the state when we shouldn't. We need to discern what they're doing and how they're ruling. We can trust them above God, and this is very easy for us to do. We can look at them to provide the substance that we need to take in and live on, whether it is through the media, through regulations, or through other means. This substance that we take in from them can then determine how we live. This is especially dangerous when the state is ruling unjustly. We're seeing examples of this, if we're honest and, and discerning, especially in light of Scripture. Take small businesses, for example. A business owner can listen to the unjust rule of the state by closing their business when the state says to close it. 
because the state says to, tells them that it's far too dangerous to stay open. The business may do this because by their disregard for God and his truth and the authority, they come to believe that the government is the authority no matter the situation. They elevate, like Moses, they elevate the state. Taking this food in from the government then affects their lives, which we've seen many businesses close permanently. Think about that. The ramifications of that permanently, and many people lose their jobs. The ripple effects that then go into the home are devastating and can be very damaging. Another example of application in this principle is priests and pastors who lead people astray. Because they are in that role, because they claim to follow God and teach God's truth, and because they seem sincere, many people can trust these people above God. They can elevate them. They can take in what these teachers feed them and then live on that substance which is something that then determines how they live. We need to think about this, especially here in this application, because God's word is our spiritual food. We're to take that in. So if we are being fed something contrary to what God has said, what is that food going to do to us? I'll give you an example that really affects the, our lives in a practical way. It's the pastor or priest who believes in teaches that you can lose your salvation or justification. This is a food that you take into yourself. When it goes in you, it's something that becomes a part of you. And when you start believing it yourself, it then affects your life and how you live. So when the preacher piles on the burden that your salvation is up to you, that you must keep up the obedience, that you must pray every day, that you must not be anxious that you must give your money and all these things that you must keep up and not give away your salvation, then you live like that. You live like that in your beliefs and your behaviors. This is a burdensome life that is not the life that God has for his people because it's not the truth at all. It's actually very contrary to the truth. His life is grounded in and fueled by his power that keeps you. He's the one who keeps you. And he works within you to fulfill that purpose. And he does so, so that out of that new heart, you want to obey. You want to pray. You want to trust, and you do trust in him. You want to give. You want to do all of these things that God has commanded us to do. Not so that you are right with God, but so that you are living out of that new gratitude of his grace that he has shown you in Christ. And so it's that you don't keep up your salvation by your continued effort. That's a burden. Think about what that burden is. If you're always thinking about, man, I don't want to lose my salvation. Am I doing good enough today? Have I prayed enough? Have I studied enough? Have I... Red God, if I miss a day, what's going to happen? And oftentimes we don't think like that because we create our own standard. Here again, we're creating our own standard and in that, in that belief, oh, I'm doing okay according to my standard. But if we align it to God's perfect standard, how many falls, how many sins would kick us out of the kingdom if we align it up to his standard? So this teaching is damaging, and it's food that we take into ourselves. So we better really discern what we're taking in. Now these are the implications of trusting in someone else other than God. These are the implications of following a supposed authority of someone else other than God. We're, we're following an authority that is not God. These people have trusted in and followed Moses when it wasn't even Moses who gave them the manna in the first place. It was God. Moses was just a mediator between God and man at that time. That was to direct them to the true bread that God would give in his son, the Messiah that was to come. They didn't take him at his word, but twisted his word 
which caused them to reject his word, yet they still appealed to his word. You see the darkness of sinful man and the effects of sin? We should be baffled by this, but yet not surprised. Adding on to this obstacle, they then create another one by their lust for more. After Jesus responds to them, they then don't get what he says and jump to commanding him by essentially saying, give me more. Give us more, Jesus. They say in verse 34, sir, they said, from now on, give us this bread. Sir, always give us this bread. They don't say this in a believing way by faith as if they now see him for who he truly is and why he truly came in providing eternal life. We know that this is not the case because of what the rest of the chapter says, what transpires in that rest of the chapter. Their motivation coincides with what Jesus said earlier, that they just want their fill of food. They just wanted to be provided for. They even say that they want this food always, from now on, and forever. Give this food to us. They want want the provision of food to never end. This mainly shows us that we want something from Jesus, but not Jesus himself, and what he truly gives. They want him on their terms. Now, this is a scary place. Because they are happy to take him when he provides what they desire. So they can easily turn Jesus into a different Jesus. This happens today where people take a Jesus happily when they think he provides what they desire. And the problem is, when people do this, they create a Jesus that's not Jesus. It's a false Jesus. One of their own making, one that appeases them. And they totally miss what he truly gives because they so desire what they want from him instead. And they're missing a whole new life of what that truly is with God's grace active and reigning in that new life in Christ. They totally miss it. To all this, though, we see Jesus, the true Jesus, respond by saying to them basically, You have no idea. In his response, we essentially see three points. First, he confronts them with the fact that it was God who provided the manna, not Moses. And the whole reason for that manna was to point them to the true bread from heaven, the bread of life himself. And again, they were so corrupted in their opinions and distortions that they thought it was Moses who was responsible for the manna. You wonder, what scripture were they reading? What scripture did they know? Because you go back to Exodus 16, and it clearly says that God was the one who provided the manna. Plus, the whole point of the giving of the manna wasn't to stop there, especially not at Moses. It was to cause them to look past that, through that, to the coming Messiah. And with these people, the coming, Messiah, the coming Messiah was right there with them, in their midst, right there. He had now come. They were again too blind to recognize him, see him for who he truly was. And the blindness of man is astounding when we look at it through the eyes of those that have been redeemed. It's astounding to see how sinful man is. To see how blind they are. Don't you see that? The believer in God says that often. And they even say that about themselves when they see what they've done. When they've fallen and they come to repent. Why did I do that? How blind can I be? We see the effect it can have in an example like this of these people in the crowd who are putting pressure on Jesus. They're missing it, that Jesus is the bread from heaven that God has provided. They're totally missing it. Which the feeding of the 5,000 was to be a physical illustration that revealed him. 
to point them to him so that they would come and rest in him. Take the food that he gives. They're blind to the truth of Jesus' claim that he is the bread come down from heaven. The bread that God has sent. Two, further we see in Jesus' response that they were right there with the gift of God. Smack dab in the middle of Jesus' substitutionary life. And in what he does and says, he is revealing his sacrificial death that was to come. His time hadn't come yet for that. These people were demanding signs for proof when they had no idea. Imagine being alive during that time. Alive as Jesus was living his life where he was the substitute, fulfilling the law's demands on behalf of those the Father gave him. He was to give his life. He was to give his life in perfect obedience while living. And he was to give his life in perfect submission to the point of death. Death on a cross. They demanded he perform a sign, but little did they know that his whole life and death would be a sign from God showcasing the graciousness of God in Christ. The greatest sign to ever be seen, he would have no idea. Totally blind to it. And unfortunately, many today are as well. Many have no problem with Christianity if it doesn't infringe on their life. Many even show support of Christians without realizing the problem that they themselves face. And many people are around God's work as they are present in the church, but yet have not been recipients of his work within them. They see Jesus, but yet they don't believe truly. What a tragedy that is. But as Jesus' ministry progresses into the final phase here, many have no idea what's taking place. Much of that is because they need to be more concerned about the state of their soul than the state of their stomach. But they're not. That's the third point we see in Jesus' response. Religious people need this concern for their soul when it has been showed to them that there are obstacles in their way of Jesus and his gift that he alone gives. There are many obstacles that we put up, especially if we have an external form of religiosity. We put them up. That's our identity in religion. That's our identity in God. And too often when this confrontation happens, the concern is swept under a rug of false securities. Here, these are your obstacles. This is what is in the way of you and Christ. No, I'm good. No, I'm good. I I know I'm good. After biblical evidence, evidence given, given. Here's God's word. I'm good. Like them, many people lack the sight to truly see what is at stake. And for that to really affect them. Now think about that. This is serious. The state of our soul is serious. And this should be even, be even more serious this time of the year. But yet we run through our holidays. Not even a thought, really. This lack of concern then shows in what they pursue, what people pursue. Remember that Jesus confronts their lack of intense pursuit for him, the food that endures to eternal life. Instead, they're captivated by temporal satisfactions, by worldly ways. Like them, many people can lack the sight to truly see what is at stake. Jesus says that he is the one who gives life to the world. So that means that the problem that humanity faces is one of lifelessness. And he says this in verse 53. 
Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Without salvation in Jesus, you have no life in you. This is serious. Does the state of your soul concern you? It should, whether you're a true believer or not. If you're a true believer, that's going to be a catalyst that drives you, that brings you closer to Christ. Because you know what's at stake. And you know how you have been redeemed out of darkness, out of sinfulness, out of depravity, and you've come into the light of Christ. You know how serious this is. And you're even concerned for your soul in that sense that you care for it. You nurture it. You want to develop in your growth. Pursuing Christ and Christ alone because he's your everything. So you have a concern for that in that sense. If you're not a true believer, then you'll be tossed around. Led astray, distracted, captivated by falsehood or the world. And just blind to what should concern you. If you're not concerned for the state of your soul, then you're concerned in something else. Something else is captivating you. Something else is taking you away. This comes back to the obstacles that get in the way. There are many obstacles that sinners face before salvation. But God takes them away. He takes them away with ease as he brings sinners to take in that bread of life, Jesus. God causes a sinner who has no life in them to come to life and to take food. Food that endures to eternal life for the first time. And they live on that food continually during that new life. They live on Christ. Their concern is for him. Because of what's at stake. And they pursue him. With all of their life. There, he is their everything. So God takes these obstacles away. In salvation. And though they try to come back in the Christian life. Though we try to build them up. He knocks them down. Brings us to the ground in repentance. And awe and joy in Christ again. And we continue to move on. Growing stronger in Christ. So Jesus is the bread of life. Eternal life is the food we need. And this comes only from the one who is life himself, Jesus. So this must be a great reminder, especially this time of the year, where there can be many distractions, many obstacles. Who's your focus on? Who are you living in? And is there anything between you and 